Well, you know, I think that the interventional procedures are probably going to increase in frequency due to the CDC guidelines. And under the CDC guidelines, well, first and foremost, the CDC guidelines are emphasizing non-pharmacological therapies and non-opioid therapies. Subsumed under that are procedures, you know, injection therapies. And I feel like this is um, an important area for primary care doctors to understand, and specifically, if we look at patients who have low back pain, I mean, that's one of the top three pain conditions. Lots and lots of patients suffer from low back pain. Well, the etiology can be multifactorial, but if patients have back pain and shooting leg pain, for example, those are typically good candidates for epidural steroid injection. So I think that's important for primary care doctors to keep in mind. Again, back pain and shooting leg pain. If they just have back pain alone, they're typically not good candidates for epidural steroid injections. And frankly, the same process, the same theory exists in the neck. If patients have neck pain and shooting arm pain, it's that shooting, that ridiculous component of pain that can be treated with the epidural steroid injection. Another cause can be the facet joint. These are the stabilizing joints in the low back. They help reduce the compressive forces that we place on the spine in a downward fashion. And again, as I said, they help stabilize the spine. Well, these joints can become arthritic, they can become hypertrophied from injury, from older age, from stress, and can lead to low back pain. So in your mind, you wanna think of patients who have axial lumbar pain, that is just low back pain that's on either side of the low back, not necessarily centrally, but on either side of the spine. In those patients, think in your mind of a differential of facet joint mediated pain. Those patients can benefit from what we call medial branch blocks. That is, there's a small nerve that provides sensation to those joints. We can block those with a little bit of local anesthetic. If patients respond well to those blocks, report significant pain relief, the follow-up procedure to that is called a radiofrequency denervation procedure. And that's where we use a device that uses hot heat therapy to denervate, to deactivate that small little sensory nerve to provide more sustained relief. So it's important, I think, for the primary care doctor to keep in mind that if patients have low back pain, not central, but on either side of the spine, it can even be in the buttock area, sometimes it's the legs, that the facet joints may be the cause. So think about referring those patients to a pain specialist who does interventions. And then finally, if patients have pain that's in the low, low back, say L5 and below, the sacroiliac joint can be the source of pain. Those patients typically might say they have pain around the buttock low and the lumbar spine, maybe down to the posterior thigh. Often patients will say they've been in some traumatic, uh, they've been in an accident, for example, uh, they've lifted something heavy very quickly, or they've been lifting something for long periods of time. Those types of activities can stress the sacroiliac joint and lead to pain. The good news is that if that pain exists, we can do a diagnostic block inside that joint. And if patients respond, there's an interesting procedure called a cooled radiofrequency procedure, which uses, again, heat energy to deactivate the nerves that supply that joint. And if you look at the data on that, I mean, the data is fair for cooled RF procedures, producing anywhere from three months to a year's worth of relief, which I think is pretty good. This is a, a burgeoning area uh, in the market. I mean, the market is, is skyrocketing with respect to the use of neuromodulation and specifically spinal cord stimulation for the reduction of pain. I think it's important for primary care doctors to keep in mind that patients who have had spine surgery and unfortunately who continue to have low back pain and shooting leg pain are good candidates for spinal cord stimulator procedures. It uses tiny doses of electricity along the length of the spinal cord to interrupt pain signaling from the cord to the brain. It's a safe procedure, it's reversible, meaning that in time, if we need to, we, need, we could take the stimulator out. But there's great value, I think, in, in considering spinal cord stimulation in patients who specifically have had what's called fail back surgery syndrome, or who have other causes of low back pain that are intractable that lead to back pain and shooting leg pain, and for that matter, neck pain or shooting arm pain.
And then if patients, if primary care doctors see patients who have cancer-related pain that is intractable, suppose they're on opioid therapy and the opioids are reducing the pain but not enough, or they're causing many different side effects. Well, the intrathecal pain pumps that use tiny doses of morphine, tiny doses of local anesthetic like bupivacaine directly to the spinal fluid can really be helpful because the doses are small, the medication bypasses the gastrointestinal tract, often the side effect profile is much better than it is for oil opioid therapy or other medications they're taking by mouth. So if you have patients that you see who have cancer pain who aren't doing well, consider the pain pump. Or if they have spasticity associated conditions, aren't doing well with medicines by mouth to reduce that spasticity. For example, if they've had traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, or multiple sclerosis induced spasticity, we can use baclofen intrathecally, that is you can place baclofen into the cerebral spinal fluid, target the, the receptors in the spinal cord that help reduce spasms. And this can be very, very effective in certain patient populations who have intractable spasticity. If we look at, again, neuromodulation, that is sort of losing tiny doses of electricity to reduce pain, the technology there is ever expanding. We have now you know, six companies that manufacture the spinal cord stimulator device and some of them are quite innovative. For example, we have a company that traditionally when you place a stimulator device, uh, you place the wire on the spinal cord and you activate it, patients will feel a tingling sensation, a paresthesia in the area of pain. Well now we have a spinal cord stimulator device that does not produce that tingling sensation and yet can reduce pain. I think that's intriguing and it may be useful for low back pain. Typically stimulation is useful for that radicular, that shooting neuropathic campaign, uh, component of pain and it's harder to target low back pain. Tons of patients have low back pain. So this particular new spinal cord stimulator device may be more helpful for targeting low back pain. There's also a new peripheral stimulator device that was recently launched just a couple of months ago that uses something similar, a small, very thin wire that's placed subcutaneously for patients who have peripheral neuropathic pain, say in the shoulder, maybe the inguinal area. And I think that's innovative, that's new, and it's very non-invasive. So I see, I see that as offering yet another modality, another procedure for pain relief in patients who have chronic pain.